We're so thrilled you're here with us to learn with one of the great, um, uh, one of the great thinkers um, and uh, and scholars of our time, Rabbi Yisachar Katz, who is the chair of the Depart Department of Talmud at Yeshiva Chovave Torah, where I was privileged to go to rabbinical school. Rabbi Katz received ordination in 1986 from Rabbi Yechezkel Roth, Dayan of UTA Satmer, and studied at Yeshiva Beit Yosef in the Vardik for over 10 years. A graduate of the Hashar program for Jewish educators, Rabbi Katz has taught at the Mayanot Yeshiva High School for girls and SAR High School. Um, his brilliance of intellect is only matched by the depth of his neshama, and we are so thrilled to have him uh, to, to, to be our teacher today on this important topic, Shomea Ka'one, Hearing Legally Counts as Speaking, Creating a Community Which is Inclusive of the Blind, the Deaf, and the Infirm. Rav Katz, thank you for being here. Thank you, Rav Shmuley, for this beautiful um, introduction. And of course, thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, I was actually in Nashville two weeks ago by another of our graduates, Rabbi Saul Strasberg, who is the rabbi in Nashville. And it was my second time there. And I'll say to you what I said to him, which is the first invitation is for a kavod. The second invitation is for recognition, you know? So the first time you invite, because okay, it's a rabbi and you want to call him out and then it flops, but okay, it was my rabbi. If you're being called back, you know that, okay, it was a success and you're being asked uh, to repeat uh, what you did. So thank you for the honor once again to teach with this wonderful, wonderful um, community. And um, it goes without saying that being invited by a uh, you by Rabbi Shmuley is always a schut. Uh, it allows me to tap in a little bit to uh, your avodas hakodesh, um, and uh, I can't um, say enough of what a privilege it is to be even a small cog in this um, sacred machine, the sacred uh, avodah that you do. So yashikoa. Um, I'll plunge right in, and uh, not to take people's time. Um, obviously, I don't know the value Beit Midrash etiquette in terms of screens and uh, videos or not. Uh, for those of you who have to be off the video, of course, please be so. If you could be on the video, then uh, of course I would prefer that. Um, do we have captioning? Someone just wrote that they need captioning. Uh, unfortunately, we don't. That's something we would need to set up in advance. Okay, okay, okay. Just Chaval, because it is a topic about the deaf and the mute, so uh, it would have been uh, nicer. So my apologies. Um, why am I interested in this topic? So for those of you who know my work and my writings, um, I would say that my two primary um, focuses um, or foci, I don't know English, English is my third language, so you'll bear with me. But two of my primary focuses is A, uh, the queer, the LGBTQ community for whom I've written extensively. Uh, and then disabilities is also an issue that I've written extensively and worked on a lot. And I'll often get a question of why are you so, um, you know, devoted to these two issues? And, um, you know, obviously there's the obvious reason, um, I dedicated my life to learning Torah. And when there's an opportunity to learn uh, a new area of Torah, I jump at the opportunity. Um, as I often like to say, um, I think that if we think about it, the Orthodox community owes a huge depth of gratitude for the um, LGBTQ community, uh, because um, I like to say that it wasn't that long ago when someone said, I'm Orthodox and queer, they would say, oh, that's very funny, you can't be both. Uh, and thank God Hashem, we live in a world uh, where that no longer is a joke. That, that is now a reality. Someone can be queer, someone can identify as LGBTQ and still be an Orthodox Jew. And for me, as someone who cares about Torah, it's enriched my Torah learning in a way uh, that I cannot even begin to describe. Um, I always love to use a bunch of examples of uh, the kind of questions that are being asked now that we have um, you know, queer Jews who are observant that we did not ever have to deal with. Uh, and the best example I like to give is that I was a rabbi in a shul for five years in Brooklyn in Prospect Heights, and there was a significant LGBTQ community there. And one year before Pesach, the phone rings, and I see a number of a lesbian couple that was in the shul. And, you know, not to be cynical, but before Pesach, you know, as a rabbi, you kind of think, um, okay, I know it's going to be a microwave question or an oven question or a, uh, you know, a kitten yoke question and all that. Okay, fine. I like to answer those, but no. What was their question? And they said, here's the question, Rabbi, my partner and I are not the same. One of us is Sephardi and one of us is Ashkenazi. What should we do about kitten yoke? Like, oh, what an amazing question to get. Which rabbi in history has gotten a question about kitten yoke from a lesbian couple? 
It was just amazing, 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 amazing. So why am I so interested in that? So A, because I like the enriching of Torah, and B, for those of you who know my, a little bit of my life story, um, <clears throat> I grew up ultra-Orthodox. I was raised in the ultra-Orthodox community. Uh, I have no horror stories for you if that's what you're looking for. I was raised in a beautiful, beautiful family of very loving parents, very warm home uh, with seven children. Um, but you now we evolve, we grow. And I was around 30 when I realized that that's no longer who I am. And I started kind of moving out of that community. And again, not to compare um, you know, experiences, but in my small little way, there was a long period when I lived in a closet, when I was terrified terrified if people found out that I'm no longer the ultra orthodox person that I was. It was frightening, it was scary, it was debilitating, uh, and it made me sympathize to the idea of someone living a life that's ethical, that's moral, that's correct, but still, for some reason, if people were to find them out, they would suffer tremendously, and it made me very sympathetic to this idea. Uh, and in fact, I'll just say one last thing, and now I'll get to our topic, is that oftentimes you'll hear people talk about, oh, you know, how miserable it is to be in the closet. It can sometimes lead to suicidal ideation. And then you'll hear an, um, another person say, oh, come on, don't exaggerate it. Don't be so melodramatic. And my answer always is not an exaggeration at all. Not an exaggeration at all. When you live alone in life and you can't tell people who you are and walk around thinking, I might lose my family, I might lose my parents, I might lose my children, it is devastating. So that's kind of what inspired me to kind of um, be passionate about the topic of LGBTQ. And, you know, along the lines of disabilities, uh, people with disabilities have not been treated the way they should um, uh, in the Jewish community, in the halachic community. And I feel that, you know, we can do better for them. We can make the halachi community more inclusive of people with disabilities. And once again, on a small level, um, you know, I'm a Kohen. I'm a Kohen. And uh, Kohanim are disqualified if they have any sort of blemish. In fact, I will give you a little quiz test right now. If you look at me, could you tell why I would be a disqualified Kohen? What about my me would disqualify me? Anybody, feel free to speak up if you want, if you know what it is. You just have to look at my face and you'll know the answer. This is it. Glasses. Vision. This is it. You can't see I it. I have <laughs> faulty vision. I have faulty vision and therefore I'm a blemished Cohen and I am tempted to run around in the street and yell, no, I'm not. I just don't have the best eyesight. But thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so I feel very kind of passionate because, you know, I love my kahuna. I love being a kahuna. Whether I'm looking forward to a Besamidas where we can slaughter animals or not, that's another shiur for another time. But I love the identity of being a coin, being a descendant of Ahara and the high priest. And disabilities have become a good one. Finally, last thing I'll say is that the good news is halacha has mechanisms to address some of the issues. And what I want to do today with the time that I have is explore one example of a topic that any yeshiva boy, or thank God in the 21st century, we can also say yeshiva girl, must probably has come across the idea before. It's a concept, it's a topic. And I often used to say, I used to teach in Borough Park um, a Dafiomi class seven days a week. And uh, if you can excuse the arrogance, it was a very successful class. We had about 80 to 100 people every evening showing up seven days a week and all that. And people would ask me, like, what do you attribute the success to? Why do you think so many people show up? And I said always, it's very simple. If you dig deep enough, you will find that every page of the Talmud really tells a story. It's not Talmud. It is the Jewish story because every page of Talmud at some point or another in Jewish history became a point of debate, a point of contention, a point of discussion. And through the pages of the Talmud with the right research, you will learn a tremendous story. And that's what I want to do with you tonight, to, today. Uh, in the morning, I, I don't know, I'm so confused. Pacific time, um, Eastern time, like today, let's just say today. How do you have breakfast or lunch or dinner? That's up to you, but today. So it's a concept, like I said, and I'll introduce it in a moment. And this concept has kind of gone with us throughout history and at each stage has added another twist 
that became very relevant. So let me share with you my document and let me start um, exploring with you together today this idea. So we have a phrase in Allah that's called Shomeya Ke'one. Um, anybody want to bother translate what Shomeya Ke'one means? Anybody who's ever been in a shul has experienced the concept. Maybe you don't know that's what you've been experiencing it, but you've been experiencing it. But there is a concept of Shomeya Ke'one. Anybody want to bother translate? I'm not trying to put you in a spot. If you're not comfortable, that's fine too. Go ahead, anybody. Listening is as good as saying it. Exactly, exactly. Because I'm sharing the screen, I don't see um, all the people responding. Yes. The idea is that in halakha, there is a notion of vicarious speech. That's really what it means, right? Vicarious speech means that I can sit silently, not say a word, and it will be, con it will be constituted, it will be considered as if I spoke. Shomeya, hearing words spoken, spoken is equivalent to having said words. Where do you encounter it in the synagogue every time you show up in the synagogue, anybody? Anybody know? Speak up if you know you encounter it every time you go to shul. You uh, encounter this. That's the Hazarat Hashatz. Why does the Baal Tfilah repeat the, um, the, 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 the Amidah? Why does he repeat the Tfilah? In case there were people who can't read it on their own. So he will read it for them. They will hear it. And hearing it would be considered repeating. So every time you go to the synagogue, you are visual. You are in the presence of the concept of Shemaya Ka'on. Okay. What's the basis of Shomea Kona? What's the basis of hearing is as if you are speaking? Is there's a beautiful Rashi, and Rashi says that the following is the reason for that. Why can I fulfill my obligation by your oral expression? It's because all Israel are guarantors of one another for mitzvot, which I love. I love the explanation. We are not individuals, we're a collective. And as long as Aglaya, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. Yeah, so as long as Aglaya has not fulfilled her obligation, my obligation is incomplete. So me and Aglaya are teams, are a team of two people who need to do our obligation. So I'm obligated to make sure that Aglaya fulfills her obligation. So when I speak, I'm speaking and Aglaya hears, we become a team. Together, we are now fulfilling the mitzvah. Me by uttering the words, Aglaya by listening to the words, and Aglaya has said the words. I want to stress it. Aglaya's mouth was <laughs> shut tight, right? And she still spoke. Can you imagine that? Anybody who has children would love to have kids like that, right? Why don't you speak with your mouth shut, right? But that's what Shemea Kaona means. Shemea Kaona means there are possibilities of us hearing and he would be considered as speaking. Now, what's interesting about this concept is that throughout history, it's caused a lot of debate. The first time it caused debate was between Rashi and his grandson. Anybody know who is the most famous grandson of Rashi? Okay. The most famous grandson of Rashi is someone by the name of Rabbeinu Tam. That's his name. And unfortunately, there was no Freud at the time. Because things Judaism would have been so different if there was Freud. Why? Because there is not a page of Talmud in which Zaydi and grandchild don't fight. Literally every page of Talmud, there are multiple debates, multiple arguments between Rashi, the grandfather, and Rabbi Tom, the grandson. In fact, I always try to kind of joke, half jokingly, imagine Shabbos lunch. Rabbi Tom, whose real name was Yankov, so let's call him Yankele for a moment. Yankele shows up to Zadie's house, and Zadie says, So what was the deal with Yankele? And Yankele says, You know what, Zadie? I think there are about seven mistakes that I caught you on this week. You know, and then the next shop was they come back. 
another seven mistakes. And are you ready for the peak? Do you know what is the biggest thing that Yaakov thought his AD got wrong? Anybody know? Fill in. He thought that Rashi's fill in our pasul. They're in value. They're not kosher. I always try to imagine visually that Shabbos table. So, Yanko, what was it this week? You know, Zaidi, the last 70 years, when you were putting on fill in, no, it's useless. It doesn't count for anything. They argued about everything. So, they also argued about Shemayak Ona. So what could be a debate about this concept? What would be two ways of understanding this concept? Anybody? Go ahead. It says it Diane, but, but I know it's not. Go ahead. My name's Dove. Dove. Um, it could be totally passive, meaning it could simply be that one person speaks, the other one is present, and he's Yotzi because of the phenomena. And mm -hmm. it could demand kavanah on the part of both parties. Yep, yep, yep. And even further, how literal are we to take this? Hearing is like speaking. So does it mean literally you spoke? Why does it matter? Here's what it matters. All of us have been in a situation where we were in a synagogue, we're reciting the Amidah, but the Shliach Tzibur gets to Kiddushah, gets to Nagdishach. What should you do? So Rashi says, pause your own prayer, listen to the leader of the davening, and Shemaya Karuna would make it as if you said those things that everybody's supposed to say. Right? We have Shemaya Karuna. So you're in shul, you're in the middle of saying your silent prayer, and then suddenly the community arrived to Kiddusha. Be quiet, listen, and Shemaya Karuna. What's the problem with that? What would be the problem with that solution? Okay, be quiet, listen. Listening is like speaking, and that's it. If it's genuinely as you're speaking, then you'd be interrupting your own shmonis. Exactly. Yankala, this grandson says, Zaydi, what are you talking about? You're in the middle of your shmonis, so you can't chat. So you're telling me I should listen, and listening is like chatting, but then I'm chatting in the middle of the shmonis. So that became a big fight. And it goes to what Dove was saying, Shemaya Keona is listening equivalent to speaking or is listening as if you spoke. So that's kind of a big debate during the medieval period. Um, am I seeing a hand raised? Okay, I thought someone had a question. Okay, let's move to the um, early modern period. And this is a tragic story. This is a tragic story. And it is the example of the halachic example of I looked at the mirror, I saw the enemy, it is I. And you have the sources in front of you. I don't want to bother you with the sources. It's there, everything I'm referring to. You can look it up afterwards. This is a story of Rabbi Binyamin Zev, that's his name, who lived in the 16th century. And he writes the following tragic story. He writes that all his life as a rabbi, when someone asked him, if a blind person can be called to the Torah, he followed the stringent view, which said, no. Why no? Anybody? Why would the answer be no? If because, you're blind. Yes, go ahead, uh, Lena. Or Mira, because which we one can't, are you? I'm, I'm Lena. This is go Mira. Ahead, yes. Hi, Mira. Um, we're blind, so we can't be called up to Torah because we can't actually read the words from the Torah. Shkach, right? So the law is, according to some opinions, not to all opinions, that calling up, being called up to the Torah is basically being invited to read from the Torah. But if you're blind, then all of a sudden you can read from the Torah. So then it's a problem. And then the tragic thing happens. As I said, Rabbi Benjamin Zev looks in the mirror, saw the enemy. It is I. He aged. And in old age, he was a blind person, right? It's no longer a hypothetical about someone else. It's me. And all of a sudden, as we always know is the case, when you have a human being in front of you, you think about things differently, right? 
I'll just kind of go off on a side story. My friend, Rabbi Chaim Rappaport, as some of you might know from England, a very great, serious scholar who is the embodiment of looks are deceiving. If you look at him, you'll think, oh, this is such a Lubavitch Hasid. He has a really all-time Lubavitch Hasid look. And he's open, he's tolerant, he's kind. And he always loves to tell the story about this woman who came to him and said, Rabbi, can I ask you a question? Can a paraplegic who is in a wheelchair do nesiat kapayim? You know, when the kahanim go up and they do that, can he do it in his wheelchair? And Rabbi Rappaport doesn't wait a second and says, no, you have to be standing when you do nesiat kapayim. So the woman says, well, let me just be clear. I'm not asking hypothetical. I have a son in a wheelchair. So Rabbi Rappaport says, you know what? Let me think about the issue, right? All of a sudden, this was not just two scholars discussing an idea. This was real. So this is what happens with the rabbi bin Yaman Zev. The rabbi bin Yaman Zev realizes he's not talking about a blind person, you know, in, um, in, uh, in uh, Honolulu. He's talking about himself. So what would you say to rabbi bin Yaman Zev? Can he get an aliyah if he is blind or not? Related to what we have been talking about now, what would you say to rabbi bin Yaman Zev? Does, is blindness an impediment Two, getting an aliyah, especially as Lena said, if the person being called up needs to read from the Torah and they can't read, could they be called to the Torah? Other than Dove, if they I know, know Dove Braille, has the answer. Anybody else? Lena, go ahead. If they know Braille and they can- No Braille, read, no nothing. But, they, you know, and, and that's that's my situation. I wasn't able to learn Braille because of my hands, but um, you know, it's like even being legally blind, uh, we're conservative Jews. And yeah. you can't enlarge, you know, you I can't, can't read the Hebrew course. and I can't read the transliteration because it's an enlarged photocopy. It's not the original. So, okay. But you know. given what we have been talking about, Lena, is there a legal mechanism that would enable you to get an aliyah? Memorization. Or what have we been talking about? Which concept that we've Someone been reading about? it on our behalf? When the Balkan, yeah, everybody's reading, always, there's always someone else reading it, right? There's a Balkara reading, let's use her America, okay? right? Hearing is as if speaking, and you are as if you are pronouncing the words. And that's the concept that Rabbi Ben Yaman Zev wanted to introduce and say, it doesn't matter that I'm blind. Who cares that I'm blind? Even though I'm blind, there is someone reading. And if there is someone reading and I hear someone else reading and hearing is as if you recite, I can get an aliyah. And he said, ever since, in spite of my blindness, I accepted an aliyah when I was called up to the Torah. Not all the rabbis agreed with him. What would be the pushback against that? What would be the argument that why Shomea Kaona does not work? Anybody? If you think deeply about a concept, what would be the pushback of the concept of why the concept is not applicable here? Dove, go ahead. It seems to me that here the the um, the speaker or the balcore has to be able to see. He can't read balpe. He can't read mm -hmm. from memory. You need to have a book in front of you when you read from the Torah. So if someone is blind, you're saying that as if they're reading, but they're not reading out of a book because they can't see the book. So well, why wouldn't you say, excuse me, but why wouldn't you say just as you have Shomea Ka'ona, you would say uh, Shomea Ka'ore. So, so that's the big debate. In other words, let me put it this, this differently. What's the hardware, right? What's the mechanism of Shamea Kaona, right? So let's take two people here. Uh, Lena, you told me you're blind, right? Yeah, Lena, you told me you're blind. Uh, so let me pick yes. a non-blind person. Is, uh, who, is, uh, who, is, who is a seeing person? I don't want to assume anything. Who in the audience is a seeing person? You can use me again. Okay, sure. I love using your name because it's a beautiful name. Uh, yeah. And I love pronouncing Aglea. Yes. Yeah, okay. So let's say Aglea is reading from the Torah and Lena is listening. What does it mean that Shamea Kaona? Are we taking Aglaia's reading and transferring it on to Lena? And Aglaia did a good reading. She read straight out of the Torah, valid, halachic, and so on. I'm not getting into the woman reading Torah right now. Just, let's put that aside. But she read from a Torah, 
If Shramea Kaona means merely transferring Aglaia's reading on to Lina, that should work. But if Shramea Kaona is a softer concept, it's just merely that when a Lina hears, it's as if Lina reads, then Dove is right. Lina needs to have a Torah in front of her and she can't see the Torah, right? So that became the big debate. That became the big machloket. And it's still a machloket for some people, a blind person can be called up to the Torah. And for some people say, no, Shamea Ka'ona does not fix the problem. I'll skip in the interest of time so that we can, people can ask questions and just discuss the issues. And that brings us to Corona. That brings us to Corona. Now, how during the Corona period does Shamea Ka'ona become a very important factor. Think about the way uh, our shuls were set up during the height of COVID and how would Shemea Kaona come in and how would that help us about people with disabilities in our shuls? It could be also like you, we weren't there. You're, you're attending shul via Zoom. So you're not there in person. So does okay. it count? Are you a minion? Are you not a minion? Uh, okay, so, things like that. so Lauren, let me push you to kind of continue thinking along those lines without Zoom. Let's take out Zoom and still kind of think, where would your Mac want to come in, Lauren? Oh, you're not called up. The big debate during the street Minyanim, right? The, the porch Minyanim, right? So you had like a whole block davening together. One of them was on the porch on the east. One of them was on the porch on the west. One of them was on the porch on the north. And one of them on the porch on the south. And it gets to Torah reading. What should we do? So there were two options. One option was let the person standing next to the Torah be called up seven times again and again and again because he or she is the only one next to the Torah and they can read from the Torah. Then there were rabbis who said, no, it's okay if you're on a porch 30 feet away because Shemaya Kona. As long as you hear the Baal Korah reading the Torah, you can get an aliyah even when you're 20, 30, or 40 feet away from the Torah. And that way, we don't have to call up one person seven times, but we can call seven people. And I want to take a vote. Those of you who have spoken or have not spoken, between these two options, which one would you prefer? Would you, pref would you think it makes more sense halachically to have one person being called up to the Torah seven times again and again and again and again? Or no, let's call seven people, one person from porch number on the 20th floor, then another person from uh, the porch on the sixth, seventh floor, and then a person from the porch on the other side. They'll make the bracha where they stand, and then they'll listen to the balkara, and they'll be out. So which one do you prefer? Lena, did I see your hands up? Second option. Why, Lena? Well, one of my things is we want as many people involved as possible. So it allows people to fulfill that mitzvot you know, even though they're not literally right there next to the Torah. Exactly. Lauren, which one do you prefer? Also, second option. Same, Same thing as, as Lena. It's involving more people. And I know that the two shuls I went to, that's what they did. Yep. Yep. It's people who haven't spoken yet. Uh, what would you prefer between these two options? Someone who hasn't spoken yet. You know who you are. <laughs> Uh, Joey, um, number two, why number two, Joey? Can you speak up? Or, or write in the chat to include more people. Or write in the chat, yes, yes. That would be, include more people, wonderful. Yes, anybody else? Okay, so I guess I am in good company. I, in my school, very strongly advocated the second option. Even though the first option is halachically valid, it just felt weird. Right? Again and again and again and again and again, the same person being called to the Torah. It just didn't sound right. It just felt wrong. So I my shul, I did exactly what Lena, Joey, and uh, Lauren, uh, Lauren, is that the right name? Am I? 
Because I'm not seeing yes, it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. What they suggested. And by the way, I, I can't uh, multitask, so I can't look chats. If people can read the chats for me or tell me what's going on there, then please help me out. Okay. How does this conversation impact our attitude towards people with disabilities in our schools? The conversation we just had about, um, about the corona period, how does this conversation impact the question in school? Sarah, go ahead. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Sarah. Okay. I'm deaf. And I would really love to have automatic captioning because otherwise I don't hear a, bla a blasted thing. How okay. I participate and the Zoom program from the different schools and everything. It's rare that they'll caption and I have to beg and plead. I don't right. like that. Right, no, I agree, I agree. But I'm asking what we just mentioned, how would that impact the way, uh, the ability of people with disabilities to more fully participate in uh, the ritual, the shul rituals? Lauren, go ahead. Um, anybody who's physically disabled to the point that the person can't walk or is in a wheelchair, and can't get up on the beamer. Right now, in most schools, if they don't have a ramp, then a ramp, I should say, a person with disabilities has a very difficult time getting an aliyah, right? They have to be raised, lifted to the Torah. The Torah has to be tilted in their direction, and maybe that way they can get an aliyah. If it's true that Chermea Kaona would work, they can stay at their seat make the bracha and listen to the Baal Korah. And again, I'm not making decisions for you. Your rabbi has to decide because as Dove pointed out and as Lauren pointed out and others, Lena, it is depends on how you understand Shemea Kaona or not, but that would be the question. What exactly is the definition of this concept? And could this concept really allow a Gala's reading to transfer over to someone who sits 30 feet away from the Bina? And that brings me to my final point, and I'll leave enough time for questions. And if there are no questions, that's fine too. Moving from the deaf to the blind. And I'm very proud of this because this is my own chidush that I've not seen anybody discussing it. I believe, I believe that, I'm sorry, we're going from the blind to the deaf. I believe that sign language is no different than Urdu, Sanskrit, Yiddish, English, whatever language. Sign is a language. And therefore, someone who signs can daven, right? Can lead davening for people who understand sign. For here is my million dollar question. Shomea Kaona incorporates our auditory skill, right? Hearing is like speaking. Could we stretch this premise to our visual characteristics? Meaning, if I, as a speaking, as a person who speaks, I don't know what, what's the correct word to say someone who doesn't speak sign, but speaks correct conventional English. Is that a word, just a speaking person or what is the appropriate sensitive term? Anybody help me out. Speaking person? The... Okay, anyway, let's say if I don't need to use sign, but I know sign language and I go to shul Purim to a shul of people who are speaking sign language and someone gets up and signs the Megillah or signs dami da, right? And I read sign language. I understand what they're saying. Would we say ri'iya ke'ona just as we say shomeya ke'ona, right? In other words, halakha has developed this idea that hearing is equivalent to uttering. When you hear something, it's as if you spoke it. I am wondering, would it also be true for seeing is like speaking? 
And therefore, if I go to a shul for the, for the uh, deaf, and there is someone up there signing the Amidah, right? The Chazarat Hashats, signing the Megillah, or signing something else, and I understand what they're saying, would I fulfill my mitzvah? Because if we can do vicarious reading through hearing, shouldn't we be able to do vicarious reading through seeing? And I will end with saying that I am inspired about this question by a student of the yeshiva who is a friend of Rabbi Shmuley by the name of David Kasher. David Kasher is a student who is one of my greatest inspirations. He was a student at Chavav Torah who could hear, could speak, who was the son of two deaf parents. And one year, he was the rabbi for the high holidays of an entire community of deaf people. He led the davening sign. He gave a speech before a show for blowing in sign. He did the entire high holiday services in sign in honor and deference of his mother and father. I cannot begin to tell you how blown away I am by this person who said, my parents deserve a rabbi like any other rabbi and a Rosh Hashanah experience like any other Rosh Hashanah. And there for three days, even though he speaks, you know, conventional English, speaking English, for three days he signed so that the sign community should have the optimal religious experience. And I am wondering, and I want to ask this as a question for you, and then open the floor for any other questions and reactions for the next uh, 20 minutes. Do you think that it is halakhically legitimate? And I want you to kind of push yourself beyond your comfortable um, space. In other words, I think my, your reaction will be, sure, why not? Play devil's advocate in your brain for a moment. Is there a, perhaps a way to argue that no, seeing is not the same as hearing and maybe this concept only applies to hearing but not to seeing or yes or no. If everybody says absolutely yes, we're always in trouble, right? The Gemara says, Kule Zakai Chayav. If the entire court, um, you know, um, um, exonerates someone, something must be wrong. You can't have uniformity. That's the multiplicity of opinions. So let's just kind of play the back and forth. What would be the pros of taking this idea of Shamea Kaona and transferring to seeing, and what would be the cons? Why yes, why no? Let's play rabbi for a few minutes. You're the rabbi, I'm giving you temporary ordination. For the next 20 minutes, you're ordained, all of you as rabbis, and as rabbis, what would be the argument for Aguila, it's just for 20 minutes, Aguila, so that's for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, it expires alone, so don't get too excited. <laughs> what would be the pros or the cons? I am all open for this question and any other question. My presentation is done, and as I said, um, the sources are in uh, uh, available for you. I thought it would be much easier to just talk to you directly. So go ahead, Lena, you had your hands raised. Yes, um, I actually have both sides. Um, oh, good. One, uh, yeah, that, I... that, you, you can be a lot for the rest of your life. Lena. <laughs> That's what her is all. And I was going to interrupt you first with a story, and then I'll let you go. When I was eight years old, I come home, and I'm in a Haredi yeshiva, so we start learning everything early. I started Gemara when I was seven. At eight years old, I come home to my dad, and I say, Daddy, or as my wife likes to correct me, you didn't say Daddy, you said Tati. Be honest. All right. I said, Tati. I started learning halacha. I'm so excited. And you know, my father was an all time European father. There was no, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. Or you're so cool. He's like, let me give you a test. Really, let's see if you really know halacha. So, of course, he quizzes me right away. But you would think, even so, quiz me on something light. He says, what bracha do you make on banana? No, that's not what he asked me. You learn because we were learning the laws of brachot. What bracha do you make on barley soup? I don't even know the answer now, right? Is it the barley that's mazonot? Is it the carrots that's more adama? Is it the soup that's shahakal? And I say, you know, Tati, it's a machloket. It's a debate. And my father said, yeah, Yisachar, that would work for the rest of your life. Every time you'll give that answer, you'll sound like a scholar. You know, so Lena, you're a scholar. So go ahead, Lena, pro and con. Well, I, I think that, you know, for the aspect of inclusion, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I think that what could happen is, you know, it's like, hey, I would approach it that, um, 
hey, I have, you know, my friend here who's going to actually verbalize the reading and, and you know, and, and move the, uh, crap, I forgot the name of the finger, but, you know, move the yeah. thing for the reading. Yeah. And, and I would do yeah. the, um, you know, and, and I would do the signing. But then I also see, well, because you're not moving it and you're not right there seeing, what if you see a wrong word and you, mm -hmm. you end up signing the wrong word and no one knows necessarily what you're signing to others. So there's no overseeing of what you're signing as well. So you kind of, you know, again, both sides. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, anybody else add to what Lena said, um, exact, um, elaborate? Alex, go ahead. Yeah, Rabbi, sorry, there was a, Joey had uh, some kind of questions on this in the chat. Uh, it says, does it hinge on understanding what is being said or seen, like Jews who aren't fluent in Hebrew, but follow along in shul without fully understanding? Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, Joey. And that's why I picked Megillah, right? What's unique about Megillah? In Megillah, you need to know the story. You don't need to know the words, right? So for example, with Shema, Joey, it would have been a little bit more complicated, right? Because Shema, you have to say the exact words. And then the question is, what happens if you roughly understand? And in fact, Help me out of here for those of you who, who know sign language. People have told me that sign is not a literal translation, right? It's not a verbal translation. Shema here, Israel, oh Israel. So that raises a lot of the good questions that you asked, Joey, which is why I picked Megillah, because Megillah is you need to know what the story was. As long as you know that it was a horrible king who embarrassed his wife and then took another wife and eventually the Jews were safe and let's have a party. I'm being a little facetious, but I'm saying with Megillah, it's a specific good example. So great question, Joey. Uh, Joni, is that your name? Am I pronouncing your name right? Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you, sorry. Um, Did I, I think that it, that it works because, what? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Joni? Joni, Joni, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think that in our our current our, our understanding the, it, of the, how we share language is not just verbalizing. I think that signing and actually or reading closed captioning is are other ways that we communicate. They're considered there's still considered communication and speech. Mm -hmm. And I would extend it to have someone is nonverbal and use a communication device to verbalize what they want to say. That would also be the same kind of speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's there's no good reason there's no good reason to exclude somebody because they talk in a different way. Right, 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 right. And the truth is, you know, Joni, uh, it's interesting that you say that because. Um, I think some of us would say, yeah, why would sign be different than the other, on the other language? But you're right in extending that beyond sign. Like, what are the parameters of language, right? Yeah. Are there limits to what could be a language or what cannot be a language? When is language no longer language? And that's going to be one of the, the big questions. Again, I will say I'm not, you know, the majority rabbi. In my opinion, and I've written about it, and uh, I'm, uh, I'll be happy to get a, uh, share the sources with you. In my opinion, yeah. sign is a language like no other language. But Joni is right. What happens when we go beyond sign, right? When we go with different kind of, you know, codes or Morse code. Is Morse code a language? I mean, you understand what's going on, but you don't articulate, uh, you don't fully articulate uh, the words or um, what's the language that they, the, they write in the course. Stenograph, right? Is a, is a stenographer yeah. a language? It's not a language, it's a code, but the code tells you what is being said. So the parameters of language um, are complicated. Aglaia, go ahead. Okay, so right now I'm thinking Dominic LaCopper would have a field day with this. So, but the way that I'm thinking about it though is also sign language is not one unified language. So that's, you know, they're different, many different sign languages now. That does not mean that I'm not all for it, though. I'm still all for it, but that's something that yep, people... Yep, 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 yep. No, and, and I appreciate, Aglaia, uh, what you said, the second thing even more than the first, which is that sometimes we're terrified to raise complicated questions because, oh, uh, we'll be considered insensitive, will it be considered non-considerate, Sometimes it's complicated and we shouldn't have the fear of saying, I'm not yet sure that Allah has gone where it needs to go. And that's totally okay. That's totally fine. In fact, in fact, apropos of your example, um, someone who has hearing aids, guy, do you th think that that should be considered halakhically hearing? I do. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? 
people who haven't spoken. Dove says yes. Um, anybody else? What do you think? Nod. nod. Do you think that yes. hearing through hearing aid should be considered hearing? Yes. Here is where I am not so sure. What if someone has cochlear implants? Is that also considered halachic hearing? Now, why is cochlear implants more complicated than hearing aids? Anybody know? It's not just amplification. Exactly. Go on, Joni. Jo 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 what does the cochlear implants do? It it, I believe that it, it that it has some kind of vibration it, it, on the vibrations on the bones or the nerves. Cochlear implants don't make you hear. They allow you to do what hearing does. But you're not hearing, right? The cochlear implants translate the vibrations into your brain and your brain understands what's going on. Is that halachic hearing? Someone who blows shofar needs to be able to, sound, to hear the sounds of the shofar. Could someone with cochlear implants blow the shofar? If someone has hearing aids, I as a rabbi am comfortable to say yes, because they can hear the sounds. And since one who blows shofar needs to be able to hear the sounds, they hear them through an amplification. I as a rabbi am not yet ready to say that the same would be true for someone with cochlear implants. I'm still wondering and considering, and again, I'm, I'm going to call on you Aglaia in a moment, but I appreciate Aglaia's point. You know, I'm nervous when I say this. People say, oh, I thought he is an open rabbi and he is inclusive. Yes, but we also have standards and we also need to be able to say, um, yes, exactly, exactly, what Joey wrote. With cochlear implants, they need to learn how to interpret the sounds. You don't hear with cochlear implants. Cochlear implants allow you to circumvent your ear. So it becomes a little bit more complicated. Aglaia. Okay, this might be getting a little too like nerdy music for everyone though, but uh, <laughs> you're becoming more and more of a rabbi as the moments go by. <laughs> Great. It's like really nerdy music stuff though, but okay, like a shofar doesn't have like an actual like mechanism for pitch modulation. And so how do you know you're even going to get the right sound? Because um, a lot of the time though, and it's not that I'm not all for it though, but there are times when people cannot get the right sound out of different instruments, mm -hmm. it's hard, so yeah. Right, right, right. And, and it relates very nice to Joey's last comment about do you need to understand what's being said or do you need to hear the words, right? Let's say for Shema. Let's say Shema Kona. I go to a shul and I hear someone say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokein, Hashem Echad. Shema Kona, I said the words, but I don't know what the heck I said. Is that good? Yes, it's good. Because I said those words. Is it true for Megillah? Do I have to understand, right? What's with chauffeur? Is there a specific sound and so on and so forth? So any other questions on this or anything else that we discussed? And then I will leave you with one last question. Yes, Rabbi Dov. I want to ask you, Rabbi, what would you say about a deaf person who could not hear the shofar, but uh, held on to the shofar that was being blown so that he could feel the tikiot and the true oath? Great. Great question. Wow. Wow. Talk about pushing the boundaries of hearing. And I don't have an answer, right? Now that we have learned that we sometimes can redefine categories, is hearing purely an auditory experience? Or is hearing a means of being aware of sounds being made? But if there are other ways of being aware of sounds being made because you feel the vibrations, I don't know if you are uh, a person who doom scrolls occasionally uh, because you're just killing time, but I have unfortunately do do that. And sometimes I just kind of spend 50 minutes scrolling down Facebook for nothing and no good reason. And every now and then you come across this fascinating video. So just the other day, someone posted a, posted a video where someone has sand on the front of their car and they play sounds and the sand moves into different shapes, right? The sand didn't hear the sound, but it heard it, right? It incorporated the sound. The sand was impacted by the vibrations of the sound. So Dove is right. Maybe if a deaf person puts their hands right above the shofar and they kind of identify, oh, this was a long sound. Oh, this was a broken down sound. Would that be considered hearing? Those are great, great questions. Um, any I personally, other yes, go ahead. I personally would would not argue. I would argue that a, that a deaf person is patur, and and that and that as as beautiful an experience as it may be to feel the shofar blowing and to be sure of that, 
Yeah, it's mm -hmm. because the person's patur. They're not. They're not. They're not yot. Say the mitzvah. I, mm -hmm. I want to give you one. I want to give you one example. You asked about uh, the 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 young man who served as rabbi in his parents' deaf community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a sofer, a sofer uh, has to write with his strong hand. Mm -hmm. A right-handed sofer, if he if he can train himself to be ambidextrous, still, if he writes with his left hand, the work's not kosher. Mm -hmm. Because because it has to be like this not I, it, it's even more than it has to be this way there's not a bidi evid so it seemed to me that in a case like uh, a person who can hear and he can right. also understand sign language would say yep. that, you know i'm sorry but your your primary manner of receiving mm. information is normative you can hear and therefore you you can't be Yotzi the Tfida with with seeing it. Right, right, right. So uh, we can debate that. I'm not sure that I agree with you, but it is a valid consideration. Is there a hierarchy of languages, right? Rav Dove is suggesting maybe even if we're going to accept that sign is a language, is there kind of a hierarchy? And there's like a, you know, a more conventional normative language versus not normative. I, I disagree, but I totally hear that. Any other questions? And if not, I'm going to leave you one last question before we... <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I have I have one other comment, which is I think that the more we learn about brain function, the more we realize that things like seeing and hearing are really interpretations in the brain, right. and that right. science has expanded our understanding of what sense what sensory things are. Right. Right. Especially so, so, when you look at damage, you know what it like how something like a stroke damages the brain's function and how it can come back or you can right. find neuroplasticity can find other ways right 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 and incredible i couldn't agree you know what shmuley said it uh, better than i so <laughs> fascinating point joni uh i think that you know we have to recognize that hearing is not a direct you know feed into your our brain there's another step it goes right. through the sound uh, the, uh, receptors and then the brain interprets what's going on, which then means again, once again, does it have to be a sound? Does it have to be anything else that feeds data into our brains, perhaps right. as a language? Uh, Lena, yeah. do you have your hands up? Yes, um, yes I, I think when it comes down to all of this, you know, we're talking a lot about the, you know, halaha, you know, the law and all that, but I, Honestly, what kind of comes to me, and, and mind you, you know, we're new converts from December 2020. Um, Mazal tov. You know, Mazal tov. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. you. Awesome. For, for us, you know, we have our, our you know, our, our drawbacks because, you know, there are things that we can't do. But one thing that we really draw upon is, you know, a, you know, as important as halaha is, there's also the Tanaka, you know, um, not Tanaka, the, um, the, the ka ah. Kavanaugh. Ka thank you. Kavanaugh. Ka you know, it's the intent. What is your intent? Is your intent this or is your intent diffused and into that? If it's a pure intent and then that's the most important thing, you know, our, our, yep. our ultimate thing is to praise and worship God with everything that we have. If we don't have hearing, then we can't praise and worship that way, but we can praise and worship in our equivalent way of our hearing. For us personally, it's our sight. So it's for us, Amen. it's our equivalent. So, Amen. So Amen. That's 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 where I stand. I don't need a sermon for Rosh Hashanah. I just heard the most powerful sermon. Seriously, I'm not saying to flatter Yolina. Really powerful. Let's not lose sight of yes, Allah is an important piece of this, but there's also the piece of where are you standing in front of God, in front of Akadish Baruch Hu. So powerful. Yeah. Uh, Aglaya, and then I'm gonna leave you with a question. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, I thought I was done being told to shut up. But anyway, though. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm a rabbi. I love talkers. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to be like really certain, not science nerdy on this. Okay, so <laughs> science nerd. Okay, the reason sure. why I'm kind of, um, okay, so on Joni's point though, and then just, you know, I'm just going off of that though. Not only are all these things perceptions though, but another thing though is that scientifically though, well, hearing is all about vibrations anyway. So really, honestly, though, scientifically, though, vibrations that come through your ears or vibrations that come through your hands, how can you actually define one is like fundamentally different from the other? I mean, maybe you can, perhaps you can, though, but, you know, just going science nerd here, though, like, why is yep. there a big difference between vibrations coming through the ears and vibrations, you know, yeah. 
Right, right. And, and as a rabbi, it took me a long time to learn that sometimes the answer is, it's a good question. We need to think more about it. You've raised, you raised an incredible question. I think that was, that's what was Dove was touching on, you know. Is there a hierarchy of, um, of um, communication or is all forms of communication the same? And you're saying, let's be honest, all form of communication is receiving the vibrations that's then interpreted. So why should it be a hierarchy or not? Those are Rob good questions. Kat, Rob Katz, I'm sorry to jump in. Uh, Roe et hakolot. Can you tell us how you understand this? this, this yes. Phrase? So just explain what you're saying. Now go ahead. What do you mean? That you know, uh, in Revelation, um, th there is an idea that we that the they saw the sounds, and I, I'm asking Rob Katz how he understands this. Yeah, this. I'm not. Again, I'm not. I'm not. There we have an example of presumably vibe sounds turned into a visual, right? So it just kind of backs up what people are saying here that the sound can be received in more than one way. Uh, Aglaia, you got 30 seconds because I want to finish and uh, oh, comment. 30 yeah. seconds, go ahead. I was just said, I was about to say synesthesia, that's all. Yep, thank <laughs> you very much. Okay, here's my last question for you, given what we've talked about. I'm a Kohen and sometimes I'm lazy. Would it be okay for me to go up to Nasiat Kapaim, you know, when the Kohanim go and bless, and instead of saying the blessings, just listen to the other Kohanim as they saying the blessings? Do you think that when it comes to blessing the community, Shomea Kaona would be a legitimate mechanism to fill, fulfill my obligation to bless the community? Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to say, ask people to either Raise their hands, yes or no, or put a yes or no sign on their screen, up or down, yes or no, and I'll leave you with that question to think about it. So what do people think? If you're in, uh, on the screen, raise your arm, up or down. If you're off or you have any other forms of communication, Dove uh, down, Lauren down, uh, Clarissa down. Joey, maybe. Oh my God, Joey, I love that. <laughs> maybe. Okay, I have an option. <laughs> Joanne, J Joni up. Um, Lena, I'm not seeing yet what you're showing. Up or down? I said both. As a Cohen, <laughs> no. As a congregate, yes. <laughs> this is a group of rabbis. I love this. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you at that. It's a big question, a longer conversation. Um, and Shana Tova Imetuka. I know that uh, before you came on, Rabbi uh, Rav Shmuley and Alex talked about this has nothing to do with Rosh Hashanah. Who thought of scheduling this topic uh, uh, four days before Rosh Hashanah? I don't know about you. For me, this is the most appropriate discussion before Rosh Hashanah. When we come to God, I want to be able to say, God, I tried my best to fix this world. Please do your part and fix this broken world. And thank you for teaming with me and being a part of this process. It's a process, uh, it will take a long time, but I can only tell you from my perspective, you've moved that process along. And for that, I'm deeply, deeply indebted to you. Shana Tova Umetika, everything you wish should be fulfilled and a wonderful, wonderful, healthy year. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Rav Katz. A brilliant, brilliant share. Thank you all for joining us. As we continue to grow in our inclusivity practices, if anyone has ideas or suggestions, please uh, reach out to us. Our next class is with Rabbi Lisa Goldstein. Shalom Aleichem, a, a model for working with development trauma. We hope you will join us for that. Wishing everyone lots of brachot, lots of blessings for uh, a great year. Shana tovayim etukha, everybody.